It is our supreme pleasure uh, to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Folia Chelikel Soanjit, who is uh, our keynote uh, presenter and performer for this conference. Uh, Folia studied music theory, composition, and classical piano at Bilkent University in Ankara, Turkey, following up with a performing musician master degree in piano from Artes Fine Arts University in the Netherlands. After working for seven years in various European countries, she decided on academia and began further studies in musicology at Istanbul Technical University's Center for Advanced Studies in Music. In this period, she founded a symphonic progressive metal band called Listana and performed, wrote, published, and toured extensively in Turkey and abroad. In 2019, Folia defended her PhD thesis, Music Non-Literate Virtuosi, the Autodidact Metal Musician. After working at Sabancı University at, as a lecturer and the audio sector as product manager for Synthmaster, a software synthesizer company for 15 years, Folia is currently an independent scholar and entrepreneur working to implement a technology-based community improvement project called Music for Everyone. So. Uh, please uh, welcome our uh, keynote uh, lecture and performance, Constructing Byzantinus Within Metal. Sorry, your audio is... Uh... Audio is too low. Okay, somehow I had, I had a little bit of glitch here, but you see this is very metal. Uh, the microphone did have a proper mount, but of course uh, it malfunctioned, so I just replaced it with a huge <laughs> screw here. So anyways, thank you for welcoming me. It's a great honor and I feel a little bit too um, humbled to be in the presence of just such great people I've met. Most of you in the ISMMS conferences, actually, I've been to the one in France and last year in uh, Mexico City. So uh, it's wonderful to see uh, faces that are already familiar to me and new faces too. Oh, okay, that was my cat alert, by the way. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I said cats rule the universe. Uh, what I would like to, uh, what I would like to talk about, actually, uh, was something else today. Uh, you see one right on top of my piano, actually. Uh, but circumstances brought around that I had a gig with Listana after like nine years yesterday evening. And uh, I therefore couldn't really invite my bandmates. We would have played together for you. As you can see from my audiovisual quality, I do have a little studio set up here. So I can basically produce an album here if you like. And I would uh, like, I, I would be able to really live stream that in the case of people who are curious about that. So you will be looking into maybe my humble mix, the procedure of mixing a song. Uh, and writing and mixing and performing are often in the domain of uh, the creators of what we're talking about, metal musicians. And it's seldom that you have a person who wears both shoes, like the shoe of a scholar and the shoe of a musician. So that's the only reason I'm here, basically. Uh, let me screen share and uh, maybe in that sense, uh, we can be more um, focused on the topic that uh, I would like to talk about. So, as you can see, this is a fanciful depiction of a um, actually pre AI Istanbul and imagined Istanbul. Um, so, this was hand drawn, actually, not made by AI. These days, we are so familiar with such drawings, but this was uh, the concept picture of uh, our first album back in 2013. And uh, as the name suggests, it just like maybe sounds a little bit like Istanbul too. Um, that was actually the um, ethos. That was actually the idea that brought together the band. So I'm actually already talked about, I've actually already talked about this. Why me? I'm coming from an interesting scene and I'm just a multiple person, a musician, a composer, a producer. Uh, as a historical musician, uh, maybe I know more about Beethoven than Sepultura. Uh, still, this is a shortcoming that I should mend. Um, but 
I do see myself as a chronicler, as the person who's supposed to um, bring the streams of the back uh, of the past and the present and the future together in some sense and concentrate on my little niche for writing about it. Uh, and as fan, well, I don't have to speak a lot, as you can see. <laughs> I'm just a regular metalhead. Um, so that's why probably uh, Jeremy gave me the pleasure, Jeremy and Charlotte and all the organizers, really thank you a lot uh, for letting me do this. So uh, the story of my band, actually, it's a locality, obviously, and uh, Istanbul has got a very eclectic past and present. Uh, I cannot really speak about the future. There have been some key events that really um, have been very um, harmful for this eclectic, uh, this mosaic-like structure. For example, in 1955, there was this attack against uh, the resident Greeks, and most really left the city and the country after that, uh, the 6th and 7th um, September events that really changed the, um, or like shattered uh, the presence of uh, the culture that I'm, the continuous presence of the culture that I'm going to speak about today. So uh, there have been obviously such turning points, but other than that, Istanbul still has its former, in that sense, mosaic. Um, in terms of historical buildings, in terms of uh, social practices, in terms of music. So we would like to, in our uh, presence as a band, we would like to just give each and every of these aspects somehow. That's why we chose a name which sounds like Istanbul. The name is not ours. It's actually from an Emin Malouf novel, uh, which depicts the Levantine. Uh, Emin Malouf is a... A Lebanese author, as some of you might know, and he does write about actually his uh, Lebanese roots. And the Levantine that he's talking about, of course, is a thing of the past. It doesn't really exist today. Lebanon um, is now on the list uh, together with Turkey and Argentine on the three most uh, heavily destroyed economy countries. <laughs> so um, it's really a pity, but uh, what leaves us, um, what it leaves us with the novel and uh, this world of ideas is really still very um, inspiring. So. That's why we chose Amin Malov's depiction of Istanbul from the perspective of um, 14th century Lebanon as this fantastical uh, fairy tale city that was impossible to reach for most of the people who lived there, but maybe for a few lucky merchants. So that's where the name comes from. And now in every metal conference, we have a debate about metal subgenres. There will always be people, uh, scholars and otherwise, who want to keenly draw lines between all these um, alternative names for the same thing or uh, discuss about very minute details and try to fit a particular band into a particular niche and that always at least a, as a person who's coming from a classical music background and who abandoned that um, pathos because of uh, this dead white male supremacy uh, I found it a little bit restrictive all the time. Why do we have to, um, in a place, in an imagined place, where we can express our um, sentiments and thoughts and ideas and emotions freely uh, and um, have the pleasure of um, seeing it act as a catharsis both for ourselves and for our audience, why do we have to uh, just go into a particular box and label ourselves something? Uh, some people labeled our music as oriental metal, some people uh, labeled it as alternative metal, some said since we're using like old time signatures, actually it's more like a, a folk aspect in that sense. I love changing time signatures because it's in my blood, you see. Anatolian folk music has all these um, odd time signatures and everything, so that's why I always try to somehow put a little musical signifier in my music in that sense. I associate myself with it. So um, then you immediately stick the um, title progressive to it. And finally, of course, there's a female voice and there is a lot of uh, lush um, string sounds. They are not actually genuine sample strings. I don't much use them. I like uh, using synth strings. And I'll explain why uh, this um, choice 
is important to me and uh, the music I'm trying to make uh, in a minute. So, um, but the moment you hear orchestral like sounds and samples and everything, it's suddenly a symphonic metal piece. So why can't we just merge and just plainly call it metal? Um, that has always been my dilemma and I would be really happy to um, hear more about your insights. And then, of course, when I was at the beginning of the journey, uh, all I could do was to uh, plug my instrument into the PA. Um, rewind back two years, I couldn't even do that. You see, when you're a classically trained musician and um, a person who doesn't have a lot of studio experience, you have absolutely no idea how a recording is made. We classically trained musicians are just taught to replicate a musical tradition in the most authentic sense possible. We are not taught to juxtapose our own opinions or ideas. We just have to adhere to the style. And if you're coming from that, it's very um, both a very liberal world and a very um, almost alien world to discover a totally new musical tradition where you do have your strict set of rules, but you also have the freedom to challenge even things such as subgenre labels. So um, that rebelliousness, that um, transgressive attitude has been a part of all this uh, story for a very long time now. Uh, but since I couldn't even uh, do more in terms of production, it cost me a lot of time, it cost me a lot of money. There's very limited opportunity you will be able to find someone who, would, you, who you can really share your vision and produce together. So um, we have been um, releasing things and for the past nine years, um, other than personal reasons, I was also busy learning production. I was busy learning how to design sound, how to try to produce a rec recording, and uh, of course, advanced techniques about what to do on stage and everything. So I'm very happy that finally I get to, I get to be able to present all of this. As said, heavy lessons learned too. Uh, so this is actually the very original band picture that we made 13 years ago. <laughs> and I'm still playing with the same three guys. This is from yesterday. So it's um, a very rare event that you have small lineup changes or no lineup changes at all. That's part of the reason why I wear the Rammstein t-shirt. They are the only band I know uh, who has never changed lineup in the past 20 something years now. So uh, I'm looking up to them. And this is our band logo. This is also sort of designed in order to uh, look and remind people of an imagined um, Istanbul where you would still have that cultural mosaic I was talking about uh, intact for the most part. But uh, unfortunately, the Turkey scene is not as it was um, like 15 years ago now. And I would be very happy to compare notes with um, my Turkish friends over here, what they think, what they experience. They are both representing a younger generation than I am. And um, I see that for them, usually that's the starting point of all my um, discussions, all my presentations about the Turkish scene. Um, for them, the Sonisphere 2010, for example, which was um, out of four metal festivals in Istanbul that year was, I think, something like uh, something out of fables, something impossible, basically, because we had the big four, we had Rammstein, we had um, Slipknot, we had all these very um, big names, and it's a historical event, therefore. And now, from the contemporary perspective, today's perspective, it's impossible to have such an event in Istanbul. Um, and if it doesn't happen in Istanbul, it won't happen anywhere else in Turkey. So that really saddens me. What happened? What happened in the scope of 15 years just for uh, the people who don't know much about the Turkish scene? Uh, let me recapitulate shortly. So um, if you look at Google statistics, I've actually just looked at the Google Trends very recently. 
you would see that um, the Googling ratio, let's say, that's what trends does actually. The Googling ratio of the word heavy metal, for example, really is in sharp decline for the past 10 years. And you can also look up subgenres too. So everything about metal, say metal guitar and such, are now uh, less of uh, keywords for people. So we can attribute this to two reasons actually. One, indeed, the global interest is declining. Uh, or two, people now have much more specific um, repertoire of places to look at when they're looking for information. I would like to believe in the second, because you see, metal is really resilient. That's what keeping us, that, that is what is keeping us together for the past 40 years. Metal subculture doesn't really show you any inclination of fading away, basically. And uh, I'm rather proud of that. But um, the more um, we, the less we have it visible in the mainstream, the less you would see it in the streets. And uh, in the case of Turkey, uh, this is what's happening. Uh, back 15 years ago, when, when you would walk from the beginning of the Istiklal Street, that's the main street in Taksim. Uh, so when you walk, through um, the street, uh, you would have seen maybe four, uh, 10, 15 rock bars and metal bars in succession uh, on both sides of the streets. Now we have only like, maybe one or two in the entire region that continuously plays metal or is a live music club for metal. Uh, as said, I would like to believe this is a temporary or um, just not a reflection of a global trend and due to the reasons uh, that I'm coming up to. So, uh, some of you might have heard, again, back a decade ago, we have had some social uprisings um, which sparked from the municipality of Istanbul's decision about confiscate, confiscating a public park and turning it into a shopping mall. Uh, this happened to be a big um, emblem for especially the youth and there was these uprisings that lasted about two weeks. Uh, some people see it as an extension of this um, events that has been that have been global linked maybe to the arab spring and everything um, but from my perspective i was there among the protesters uh, i had a gas canister springing up from my back uh, so basically i think it was just a, a explosion of this suppression of youth culture uh, it was just the beginning of the story and we had all the commodities that we we, we had actually uh, from that time till now um, fast forward 12 years now we're looking up to that time and thinking oh we never thought the repercussions would be so harsh in that sense so after that uh, the next two years there were all these terror events uh, explosions everywhere. I don't want to paint you a very grim picture of Turkey and um, it saddens me to um, really draw, finger at, draw a finger at some political or religious ideology. Uh, but this proto-Islamic, um, sorry, pro-Islamic um, um, pro-Islamic agenda of the government uh, has been reflecting everywhere and it's been more oppressive day by day. And finally, in 2016, we had a coup d'etat attempt. It didn't succeed very well. Erdogan's government is still in power, as uh, those of you who look at the politics of Turkey would know. Uh, but he took this attempt as, a, as an excuse, as a pretext to assume more power. Uh, to assume presidential powers. Uh, actually, what he calls presidency is, uh, we were discussing a minute ago, you cannot be a good king. He assumed more power than any uh, democratically elected uh, head of government in the contemporary developed world would have. Uh, for example, he can issue what we call Kanun Hükmünde Kararname. This, is, this translates to something like a martial law. Um, you would be able to issue such a law only in the um, presence of a war or conflict or something regularly. But um, in contemporary Turkey, the president is, president is perfectly entitled to issue a law and say, OK, there won't be any live events um, after this time anywhere at all. So after the coup d'etat event, we, there weren't even weddings for two years. 
When I tell this, everybody is shocked. It's like it sounds like an exaggeration, but it is really true. No weddings even uh, crowd more crowded than 50 people. So um, right after that, we had a more or less a coming together of things. We had a few bands, uh, Amorphis, Soen, Dream Theater. They came over to Istanbul to perform. But then the pandemic hit and everything stopped for two more years. Uh, so we all uh, are familiar with what happened during COVID, what the musicians resorted to. Most took it as actually as a time to recuperate from performance pressure. Uh, you see, it's ne nowhere uh, on the planet easy to make a living as a musician. As a metal musician, it's close to impossible, unfortunately. So you always have to have your day jobs. For me personally, it was a period to uh, own up my skills for production, to um, work on other projects, to complete my PhD, thankfully, and such. So um, now we have, again, the, uh, the scene slowly and uh, not as big as it was uh, in a sense um, setting itself up again uh, so we have now less and less uh, live clubs who open their doors to metal music unfortunately we have less uh, organizers and less uh, band managers who would be uh, willing to um, deal with rock bands and metal bands we have a lot of um, rap music actually in the mainstream um, and uh, it's even more prominent than pop. From this day's youth's perspective, uh, the soundtrack of life is not rock music anymore. You don't really see a lot of people dressed in black, long hair and leather jackets anymore, but you see a lot of uh, rappers and that shapes the identity, that shapes the perception of daily life uh, from contemporary Turkish perspective. Anyways, the government really um, made a point about uh, keeping up the pressure even after the regulations for COVID were lifted. And I was saying uh, a minute ago in the uh, common room, uh, the ban on live music lasted far longer than COVID. It was still in place till last summer, three years after the pandemic. So um, you couldn't play live music after 12 a.m. Uh, you can't really imagine how difficult that makes life for musicians um, to really fit into a very small time plot where between work and between bedtime people could come and listen to your music, uh, see you perform. Uh, so therefore that's the um, reality of Turkey these days and I have just one interesting footnote to add. We have a profusion of tribute bands these days. Even I am a part of that. We are um, doing an Epica tribute band and I'm playing the keyboards, I'm playing the back vocals, I'm producing uh, the backing tracks too. You cannot really play everything about Epica life. That's just a technical impossibility. So I do a lot of work for that band as well. <laughs> Anyway, so um, besides an epic tribute, we have a range of bands, some in existence still, some have been a thing of the past. We have a Judas Priest tribute, tribute for example, but we also have a Gojira tribute. So a lot of um, interesting uh, formations. What I criticize about this, of course, obviously, as I was saying before, we won't maybe have um, Rammstein at all visiting Turkey again. And they came once. So they come till all the way to Athens, but they won't make that one hour trip to Istanbul. Um, because of many reasons, because probably of, uh, for the most part, economical reasons. Um, if I were to show you a graph of how Turkish lira deflated in the past two years, um, you would understand why, so, why I, am I so pessimistic. Uh, so um, actually, just I was working on a paper um, a week ago and I had to revise my figure about um, the value of Turkish lira, the um, value, the, mar um, the parity against uh, the US dollar. Uh, back then it was like 30 liras and as I was submitting my paper, it was 33 liras, one dollar. And of course, if you are earning Turkish uh, currency and if you are an agency who is busy with organizing international concerts, you cannot pay a, an upcoming band in Turkish liras. And that causes all the discrepancy and that causes all the balance for 
uh, all these tri tribute bands. So that's why we have a Rammstein tribute, obviously, because um, for people, uh, that stage presence, those shows and everything are just nothing that they could witness live again in their own country. It's also getting more difficult to uh, leave the country, to go to Europe, to attend events. That used to be really easy. Uh, right now, it's not really easy because we have because of this inflation, um, also some restrictions on uh, passport and visa issue. Uh, for example, I have a, a conference in summer in Ireland and I'm not sure if I can attend or not yet because uh, the Irish embassy gives a date for issuing a visa in four weeks. So um, unless I get the invitation letter soon, it will be even an issue for me. Anyways, that's a, a rather sad story. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not totally pessimistic yet. So uh, going back to the history lesson, going back to Byzantine, why uh, did I want to speak about Byzantine history in the presence of scholars um, whose work I'm already uh, familiar with from last year? Actually, we had uh, uh, an excellent pa um, paper uh, by Antje uh, on the representation of byzantine let me say, uh, in, in, in metal music. So my only footnote for that paper, which I put also in the abstract of my talk, is that, okay, you talk about the Byzantine subject matter. Uh, maybe visually we have had instances of uh, metal musicians assuming a Byzantine look um, and such on the stage. We had some iconography and everything. But does it really sound Byzantine? Um, how much do we know to reconstruct a lost musical tradition? Uh, so we can speak quite um, aptly about Byzantine history. We can speak about Byzantine art. Actually, here I have a surviving piece of Byzantine art from the time period that I'm going to talk about. This is maybe slightly later. Uh, I'm going to talk about the early, 12, uh, to early 11th century, um, and this is like late 11th, early 12th century, but it survived remarkably. Uh, it is a, it's one of those iconas, actually, uh, quite well-known um, pieces of Byzantine art, uh, which are actually religious drawings. There was even this belief, let me say, it was a practice, obviously, but people chose to believe that there were these um, self-made, self-forming uh, iconas too. Uh, they were miraculously forming themselves, uh, so they would have more likeness to the um, religious figures they were representing. So, of course, that's part of the myth, obviously, but um, this one is actually in Moscow now. It's um, kept in a museum. And we have one um, very uh, well-known Byzantine piece of art too. But just a minute, what did I do? Oh, sorry. I scrolled the wrong way. And it's this building here. Uh, so this is the Hagia Sophia, the subject of so many debates Basically, it's daily talked about these days because of um, it's an emblem, being an emblem for all we have been criticizing about the government and the events in the past 15 years. Right next to it, if anybody visited Istanbul, they would now know. Right opposite it, almost the same size and made by a master architect, we have a mosque called the Blue Mosque or Sultan Ahmed Mosque. It was built by um, Sultan Ahmed II. Anyways, um, so in terms of size, it's comparable. In terms of time, um, they have maybe a 900 year difference, but the plan is the same, the um, basilica pattern, the dome and everything. And um, of course, that's obviously a tourist attraction too, but it's a mosque open to uh, prayers. It's a mosque open to religious practice. And this one was a museum um, till like five years ago. And all of a sudden the government decided, no, it has to go and back, it has to go back to being a mosque. And really daily you see these um, historical bits and pieces disappearing. Um, it's, become an, it's become an emblem for um, this religious 
um, government agendas, basically. So they're holding all these important day prayers in this structure. It's obviously harming this structure. And uh, therefore, as a person who's trying to preserve a um, neutral stance, it's sacrilege to me. Uh, so the, this building was built um, in uh, the sixth century, started in the sixth century, it withstood three, four major earthquakes. It had these buttresses built by uh, a master Ottoman architect called Sinan for it to be reinforced uh, in the 15th century, otherwise it wouldn't have lasted. Uh, and um, we have uh, mosaics inside, uh, they were whitewashed for about like um, a millennia and their presence was uh, not known after the conquest, basically, not a millennia, but like maybe 500 years. They were rediscovered in 1930s. And uh, now as the um, structure is converted to a mosque again, the mosaics are not covered, but they are temporarily obscured by hangings, I hear. Uh, as it was converted into a mosque, I haven't been inside the building. Uh, as a resident of Istanbul who is keen on history, so that's also something to note, maybe. Okay, let me be sure that I'm scrolling towards the right side now. Um, so this was, um, I put the map here to remind you where we are on uh, the world, you might have an idea. And uh, the more important centers for Byzantine history are marked here. For example, Ravenna still has some surviving um, Byzantine mosaics and architecture directly inspired by the Hagia Sophia. Um, the manuscript that you're going to see in a minute is actually from Sicily from the 13th century. That's one of our most solid surviving pieces of Byzantine music. And these centers, Alexandra, Jerusalem, have been uh, very important in the development of Christianity and the schism between Orthodox Christianity and uh, Catholic Christianity. My point here is that uh, as much as uh, we as Turks, the invaders, see Byzantine as the other, as the um, antiquated, as the not up-to-date, as the conservative, and therefore um, should just go to the annals of history, so did um, the people uh, from Western Europe here. Uh, for them, of course, was uh, this, uh, this outlook even materialized um, during the Crusades, during uh, 1204, when uh, the armies of um, the Kingdom of France and um, Venice, led by the Doge of Venice, they came over and sacked Constantinople. They occupied the city and carried most of the artwork uh, towards Europe. Actually, those horses uh, that are still in Venice were from Constantinople. Maybe you heard the story. Anyway, so, um, Byzantine had no chance but to really uh, recline behind their walls and preserve their antiquity, uh, pre preserve their identity. Uh, not much left to them um, since there was all this aggression from everywhere and very little help. Uh, so about um, the visual arts, about architecture, about uh, at a point, uh, of course, you, after the iconoclastic period, there was basically no sculpture left. Uh, but we do have some representation. About music, this is harder. As I said, we have a few manuscripts remaining. We know how to decode some characters. But all in all, uh, it's thought that uh, Byzantine sacred music still lives on in oral tradition. Um, there are some um, claims that um, for example, during the, um, during the fall of Constantinople, those practices were halted, but most scholars agree that um, Mehmet II, who conquered Constantinople, was actually a very tolerant and a very enlightened Renaissance ruler type of person, and he never uh, allowed the sacking of monasteries, therefore the tradition could carry on uh, unbroken from the time of Byzantine to today to or Orthodox churches. So uh, it is regarded now as an independent entity. Uh, we do have obviously some lingering um, ancient Greek music theory practices in terms of how the modes are explored and everything, but um, for the most part it's more like a um, independent musical tradition that 
that was kept safe for a thousand years behind walls. And for urban popular music, uh, I'll play a few examples in a minute. And um, anybody who has ever heard Turkish, so-called Turkish art music, Türk sanat music, would immediately recognize, oh, okay, that's where it went. So I'm now switching to a few um, videos that I curated from YouTube uh, to give us an example. So as a scholar, a music musicologist, it's all impossible for me, obviously, to say that these are authentic, but these are good attempts, attempts that I do find myself um, convinced. So about the sound world, obviously, um, from what we can tell from iconography, uh, we still have the continuations of these instruments in today's practice, uh, not only the idiophones, but also the chordophones. This is sort of a proto-canon, which is very, very vastly used in Turkish repertoire today. <laughs> performance practice, um, Turkish art music is also performed like in a, con uh, in a company, usually by a choir, and you would have, of course, the heterophony, just like uh, in here. Uh, we have that uh, pounding bass line, if you like, uh, that's sort of a remainder of um, the movable drone that probably the Byzantine musicians invented far before uh, the Western musicians, Western polyphony evolved around uh, the Notre Dame Cathedral in France uh, during the uh, 11th, 10th and 11th centuries, actually. Um, and um, it's also closely connected to the writtenness, the sense of written notation. Um, you could just visualize it much more, much more easier if you had it in written notation. Anyway, so, um, I would say the Byzantines were earlier about that uh, due to the fact that we have some scripts remaining and um, she is just here uh, for being uh, the earliest uh, composers whose work we can really trace authentically towards her. You see, uh, this is also a religious uh, practice, the supremacy of the idea of God and uh, a yearning for breaking off with the pagan past prevented most of the artists, most of the composers of religious music uh, from branding their work uh, with their own name. So we have few works and identities uh, coinciding together and Cassia was one of that. Uh, so. Her work really closely inspired uh, many um, followers of the orthodox liturgical music, but also it's a source of inspiration even today. Um, I was around when this project was being assembled together. I was just a very excited uh, bystander, actually, uh, back then. But they really took a lot of um, effort to make this sound as uh, authentic as possible. Let's see a little bit. This is my favorite out of this collection of uh, Cassia's work actually put together for this album, which is published by Naxos. <laughs>
Okay, so going back to my presentation, uh, actually, even this much doesn't give you much of an idea uh, how to reconstruct all this tradition. Uh, we still have, um, obviously, liturgical music performed regularly in Istanbul's churches. Uh, finally, I forgot to give you one more example, which is made also during the time when Hagia Sophia was a museum. Uh, this was a project, again, um, connected to the um, Orthodox Patriarchy. Uh, let me go back to that video. Εξέδισαν αυτόν την χλαμίδα και ενέδισαν αυτόν τα ημάτια αυτού και απίδωγον αυτόν This is the entry to Hagia Sophia, actually. This is also sounding very uh, Turkish art music life uh, like to a bystander. It's because of the model use, actually. It's because of uh, how you would construct the melody line, how it just floats in between the tones of the given mode. Uh, so that gives you the sense of uh, immediate recognition. Okay, this sounds oriental and this sounds maybe not perfectly religious, but it does have this uh, high sentimental context. So um, maybe a context of uh, nostalgia, maybe from first glance, it doesn't sound like religious music to most. So anyways, uh, out of all these little uh, excerpts of uh, Byzantine music, how are you going to um, reconstruct Byzantine sound? Is it really possible? So my expert opinion is that it is not. So in terms of authenticity, what I would like to now present to you as my own attempt about creating an album on a Byzantine topic won't maybe might sound uh, Byzantine to you, uh, or maybe we, st we cannot really claim that we have been able to dig so much pa back in the past to give you, okay, this is 100% Byzantine music. I see that most uh, metal musicians do have this um, attitude, um, actually, or they don't really look too deep into the culture they try to represent. Uh, what I try to do in my music is to construct a sound world which doesn't have any association with the, for example, Western Symphony Orchestra. That's really something like a, a sonic emblem emblazoned in many of our uh, minds. If you were to look back in the past and uh, recreate a ceremonial aspect of music, if it were ever possible, it definitely wouldn't have sounded like a Hollywood or anything like big bombastic oriental music uh, that is made with a symphony orchestra. It's really popular in Turkey these days. So technically, 
what I try to do is to bring together um, an extension of the ancient Greek modes and uh, a sound world which is thoroughly modern, thoroughly based on synthesizer sounds, uh, synthesized strings and um, not much of an authentic instrument sound. So definitely this is a self-exoticism. Um, this is something that I consciously do uh, because my subject matter um, is something that I, almost like a tale. It's um, so bizarrely both real and so fictionary that uh, I can't really represent it by imitating anything. So my storyline is built uh, on the story of a succession um, that took place in the Byzantine Empire, the middle period, um, um, around um, 1030 to 1072 AD. Um, this is the Macedonian dynasty and how they came to an end, basically. Uh, so there were these co-rulers, uh, two brothers, one died without heirs and the other one only had daughters. Um, the co-ruler number one who died did, prevented these daughters from marrying because um, he always had hopes to sire his own uh, son. Of course, patriarchy dictates that you can't have a female ruler at all. But uh, if you are a born into purple Byzantine princess, your hand will mean that um, whomever you choose to marry or whomever you are married to will be the emperor. So that was the fate of um, Zoe Porphor Porphorogenita. And uh, she ended up, of course, marrying for the first time at the age of um, 50. She was very close to 50. And there was no way that, uh, although it is debated by um, historians and, of course, the practitioners of uh, all these um, cultish um, perspectives of history that she um, debated in magic and arts, in the occult arts, to um, preserve her um, youth and uh, virility, obviously, uh, she failed. So anyways, um, th then she doubled in some um, conspiracy and she fell in love with a stable boy, crowned him Emperor Michael, and in the end, uh, she ended up also um, being a victim of her own conspiracies. She had to be a co-ruler with her sister Theodora, uh, whom she confined to a monastery, whom she forcefully uh, made to take uh, religious vows. And what about Cassia? Cassia is actually, again, um, that aspect that I label as um, self-orientalism or exoticism of the subject. She lived two centuries earlier than all this. Uh, she also has all these interesting imperial storylines, but uh, let's just not go into that. Uh, I would like to show you this mosaic, which is again standing in Hagia Sophia in the second floor. And uh, this is one of the better known um, examples of Byzantine art. Uh, and it's quite well preserved too, thanks to the whitewash actually, uh, on, which was on top of that. So um, Zoe's According to the time that this mosaic was made, uh, Zoe is in her thir uh, 70s, so the last uh, decade of her reign. And this is her third husband. Actually, um, it is debated that the mosaic was uh, made earlier during her reign, but uh, they have changed the faces of the husbands. So it could well be the case. Um, we have, of course, very limited means without destroying the artwork to prove this right. Uh, you can't really take it out of the wall. It's built on the wall. Uh, therefore, of course, there are more uh, things you can read into this, how uh, Christ is depicted wearing uh, blue, imperial blue, imperial purple, uh, where the name Porphyrogenita comes from is actually only the um, privilege of ruling emperors to wear. Uh, therefore, Christ is now here depicted as uh, the person who is wearing the blue and um, the royal couple are making offerings to him. Uh, so what I try to reconstruct would be something like this. This is an AI depiction of Cassia. She's writing her work, but see, she's using the regular Western notation AI. Uh, I instructed AI to be more specific and use Byzantine notation and uh, neither Dali nor um, Midjourney didn't know how to do that. So from a historian's perspective, we still have some um, 
some currency in the world. Uh, everybody's afraid now these days. AI is going to take over. What will we do? It's more smart than us. No, it is not. It just needs good prompts and it will always be the people who will be supplying the prompts from my perspective. And this one here is even more interesting. Um, with, I, <laughs> sorry, I um, hid my captions uh, intentionally. Um, I was going to ask if anybody's familiar uh, with these, but then, of course, I mistakenly scrolled them. Uh, this is a collection by Dolce Gabbana from fall um, 2013, and he was they were the designers were directly inspired from um, the byzantine iconography and they did their best to recreate uh, that color and sound and texture and uh, the mosaics and even the looks they claimed uh, jewelry and everything actually looked quite authentic to me so the music i create is something like dolce gamana unfortunately because I don't have uh, the means or anybody would have the means to rewind a thousand years back and hear genuinely. Everything we hear so far as examples, if you scrutinize them closely, you will, for example, hear this reverb effect all over the place, uh, which somehow invokes the feeling of um, something ancient, something sacred, something uh, rather mysterious, but it's actually just an audio uh, effect. So finally, my final bit would be to share you this screen, um, which is my DAW. And this is one of the songs that will go into my Porphyrogenita EP. I've only partially recorded it. Um, not everything is here and um, the procedure you see here unfolding uh, is what we call mixing so how you would put together the strands together that go into the music and how would you uh, for example by using this effect here it's called an eq by using this effect sound the way you like it to sound um, so i'm not fully competent yet but I can give an idea. Actually, I have two pieces queued. So this one, um, this will be the opening piece of the EP album, hopefully due this summer. So this one is based on uh, the Phrygian, Phrygian mode and it does even have a Greek song, again, a conscious juxtaposition from the second century, actually. It's usually uh, given as the oldest surviving piece of music in um, historical musicology lessons, historical music, history of music lessons. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a piece in Greek, a complete song, a drinking song, uh, that dates back from the second century uh, AD. So it's pre-Byzantine, if you like, but it was fitting, so I used it. Let me give you just maybe the beginning. Okay, the chat interfe <laughs> interferes with my DAW's controls, so I'm trying to find a way to maybe turn off the chat. At the bottom, if you click the where it says chat, it'll make it go away. Captions actually are interfering. Oh, Maybe I see. I, can... I think. I can... Yeah, yeah. Okay. If I minimize the screen, it does work. Okay, here it comes. <laughs>
it. There, there have been some issues with the recording. Sorry, it doesn't work the way I like it to work. And now my screen is also garbled a little bit anyways. So um, this was back in 2015. I was working on this piece and I knew nothing on the production. So the next track to go into this would be this one. And this will sound presumably better. You will hear the guitars and everything. If I can get it to scroll, of course. to show you this because for most of you I assume there is no way to look up a piece which is still in the pipeline how to really compose a metal song uh, that was part of the um, speech that I prepared that I hoped you would find interesting but I also have my battle axe here with me so if you indeed want to hear some parts live, I would be happy to come for um, to conquer. Anyway, so um, sorry for being a little bit tongue-tied today. As said yesterday, we were performing. Uh, just yesterday night, um, at this hour, we were taking sound check on the stage, and I couldn't really find time to recuperate about this. Uh, so I'm a bit more tongue-tied than I usually am. Uh, so. My closing credits, again, a heartfelt thank you for listening to all of this, listening to my music. Hopefully, I will polish it up, fill it up, fill up the gaps, maybe do some transcriptions of um, original Cassia songs to uh, juxtapose in between. I had, a, I had that Greek song there, but somehow one of the synths were malfunctioning. Probably it's because an older project um, and maybe sometimes that happens. Uh, some of the plugins don't work very well when you move them between computers. So that might have been the case. Um, again, thank you, a heartfelt thank you. And I'm very looking forward to your comments, your questions, 